Hi, this is Dan Bedondi reporting a special segment of the InfoWars Nightly News on our October 30th, 2012 edition of the Nightly News and our special Halloween report. And have you ever wondered the history of Halloween, where it came from, where Bob and the Rappos came from, bonfires, jack-o'-lanterns and such? Well, today we're going to talk to, by, back by popular demand, Mr. William Schnoblin, which I had on our InfoWars Money Bomb a couple weeks ago. And before we get to the segment, folks, I want to encourage everybody to go to InfoWarsStore.com right now and purchase Bloodlines of the Illuminati. It's by uh, Fritz Springmeier, great book, uh, 500 something pages packed full of information about the Illuminati bloodlines. And with the order, every order you got on InfoWarsStore.com, you get a copy of the Citizen's Handbook and a couple of cool stickers for your car, you know, to display your patriotism. And um, again, uh, Bill Schnoblin, he's a former Illuminati, former 90th degree Freemason, former Satanic High Priest, former Mormon, former Catholic priest. He's been there, done it all, and now he's on the good side. And um, without further ado, back by popular demand, how you doing, Bill? It's great to be here. Absolutely. Awesome. It's a pleasure to have you back. And um, now uh, Halloween, a lot of people, you know, in public, they go out and celebrate, dress the kids and go, you know, ghouls and goblins and all this stuff, but not knowing where's Halloween really come from. What's the origins of it? What is a cult uh, connection with this? And a lot of people are misinformed what Halloween really is. And I think if they knew exactly what Halloween was, they wouldn't be celebrating the satanic holiday. Well, yes, that's very true. And uh, you go all the way back, really, to the dawn of history, and you'll find that in, in the cultures around Bible lands and the cultures of pagan Europe, the pagan British Isles, uh, this night was considered part of a, of a pageant of, of festivals that were, that were, you know, of course, pagan in origin. They were satanic in origin. And they were basically, um, you know, ways of celebrating the change of seasons. And, of course, in the Northern Hemisphere, this is when the nights started getting longer and the weather started getting colder. And it was believed that on this night, or uh, Halloween night, that the God of the dead was going to die and then be reborn later. And, of course, he was reborn on the next feast, which would have been Yule, which is December 23rd, 24th, somewhere in there. And so this time that he was dying was a time of great fear in these people. And so the way they dealt with that is by human sacrifice. They felt that if they could shed enough blood, especially the blood of, of children, uh, that they could somehow let this passing of their God be a propitious one. You know, and of course, it, this is all really evil, but we see it even in the Bible, the idea of Molech, uh, the idea of uh, Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, all these, all these different cultures all celebrated this festival by, um, by child sacrifice, by throwing babies into a flaming idol or something equally awful. And uh, this, is, this, is, this is the origins of Halloween. And the problem is, is that even to this day, it is still a high satanic holiday. It's still a high witch holiday. And that means if you're celebrating it, you're celebrating, you know, basically what, what some Satanists believe is the devil's birthday. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't want to do anything to celebrate about the devil. Exactly. And you know, the real name, I think, was called Sawin. Is that the correct, uh, the correct pronunciation? That's, yeah, in, in the Celtic British Isles, yeah, Sawin. It's spelled S-A-M-H-A-I-N, but we say it as Sawin. And, yeah, that's the, that's the ancient ancestor. And, of course, <clears throat> excuse me, at some time, you know, in the early Christian era, the Catholic Church decided to try and sort of baptize uh, Halloween and they, they, uh, and Samhain, and they called it All Hallows Eve. They associated it with All Saints Day and All Souls Day, which is November first on the liturgical calendar. Of and the this world. is their way of putting a so-called Christian stamp on something that's evil. Yes, yes, and of course, I don't think you can really do that. You can't take something that's evil and like slap some paint on, and all of a sudden it's good. You know, and the trouble is, is that in many cultures, I mean, this is kind of a universal thing, like many, many people might know that in Latino countries, they have the Day of the Dead on this day when people, you know, run around dressed up as skeletons and all of that. And, and it's very similar to Halloween. They just call it by a different name. And see, I don't think that we should be celebrating death. I think we should be celebrating life. Exactly. 
So, you know, that basically is some of the history. And see, the thing is, Jeremiah the prophet says in Jeremiah 10, 1 to 3, that we are not to learn the ways of the heathen. We are not to follow the paths of the Gentiles, but rather we're to follow what's in the Bible. And the Bible has the feasts of Yahuwah, the sacred feasts of, of him that are what we should be doing instead of Christmas and Easter bunnies and Halloween. You know, those are just, those are just all pagan holidays that, have, that are really abominable in the sight of the Almighty. And if I'm not correct, um, during the um, beginnings of our country, did our ancestors take part in these holidays? No, really they did not. Halloween was actually illegal in the days of the Puritans. It was really illegal all through the 18th and a lot of the 19th century in America. And it was only when the influx of Irish immigrants started in the 19th century, some of my ancestors uh, came over here and they, they brought Halloween with them. And, and you know how in our country we see that things gradually have gotten more and more, you know, lax or whatever word you want to use and so people began to celebrate and of course now it's become a huge marketing thing i mean they, they're trying to make it as big as christmas and uh but the trouble is again it's evil and uh i would just like to share briefly why i'm so passionate about this i had a personal experience with halloween when i was 10 years old and i was out trick-or-treating and this was, you know, way back before there was anything really sinister about it. You know, I, was, I think I was dressed as a little clown or something going door to door getting candy. And I actually was walking down the street. It was Halloween night, beautiful October evening in the Midwest. And I looked up. And as I looked up, I saw the sky was just full of demons and just black leathery things with red eyes. And their eyes just stared into me. And I could feel something unclean hit my soul at that moment. And I believe at that moment, my soul was defiled by the demonic spirits that surround Halloween. And, you know, after that, I can look at my life, even as a young child, that I gradually began to be interested in the occult and, you know, various weird things. And by the time, of course, I was in college, I'd become a witch. So I think that the danger to children, especially because children are, are more, more vulnerable, but even to adults, it's a dangerous time. And we really encourage parents to pray over their children during this season, to not let their children run around alone uh, and to not let them go trick or treat, you know, but rather have some kind of fun that you can do as a family. Exactly. Now, um, little in uh, the history here of Halloween. Now, where does the bonfire come from? I know it was uh, represented as the bone fire. You want to describe that a little bit? Well, again, in the British Isles and in probably Northern Europe as well, there was this custom of lighting. They were originally called bale fires. And it related to Baal, who's, of course, a false god. We see Baal even in the Bible, in the Old Testament. And uh, they would they would use these as a way of trying to keep the sun god from dying, like we were talking earlier about blood sacrifice. And you're right, later on they became known as bone fires, and then over the, the years got cleaned up to bonfires because, you know, they, they would throw animals into it. They might even throw babies into it in some cultures. Uh, it, was a, it was not a good thing. And, you know, because, again, this is all about sympathetic magic, about, about sending forth the lives of innocent beings so that this God, this supposed God, who, of course, is ultimately really Satan, can live. And also, uh, trick-or-treat. Uh, do you want to describe the origins of that, what that really means? Well, of course, it's not obviously been cleaned up today, but, but back in the ancient times, the idea was is that the, these, these satanic priests would go into a village and they would say, we'd, they'd go up to a house at random in that village and they would, you know, put a mark on the, on the door and say, you have to give us your youngest child or we'll destroy your house. And then we're going to take that child and sacrifice it to the dark god Saman, who's the god of Samhain, the god of death. And, uh, and of course, if the parents refused, then they would destroy the household. They'd burn the house to the ground. And, and today, of course, it's more benign. And then the kids go and say, give us candy or we'll soap your windows or teepee your trees or something like that. But, you know... It's, it's not a good thing. And again, you're, you're, you're playing around with diabolical things. And you're playing around with things that are rooted in human sacrifice, animal sacrifice, and child sacrifice. 
And uh, the pumpkins now. I know that it wasn't originally pumpkins. It was yams, you said. But um, you want to explain the jack-o'-lantern, how they basically took human flesh as wax and filled well, it? Yeah, they, they actually would take, you know, the, some of the, the r remains of these poor, unfortunate children, and they would make candles out of them, and they'd put these inside of either skulls or inside of large gourds or something of that nature. And uh, they would believe that if they pointed this grinning face outward, it would be a sign to the demons to leave this house alone. So it was kind of like a talisman to ward off evil. But, of course, the problem is, is, again, you know, there's this very ancient, if you will, cult about the severed head, which is present all over the northern Europe, all over the British Isles, uh, and, and how it somehow relates to, well, in the British Isles, it relates to Bran, the blessed he's called, but in other countries, it relates to other, other various beings, uh, gods, demons, whatever, and it, it's all very evil. It's, it's, you know, I mean, would you want to have a thing burning on your doorstep that was made out of, you know, uh, human human baby fat or something of that nature. This yeah, is I know, and the people do this stuff. all the time. And how many pumpkins are sold uh, just in the United States alone? Millions. And um, also, when they uh, gave them the pumpkin, is that when they, uh, just like you went to a household, they offered the sacrifice, is that when they put the pumpkin at you, though? Yeah, well, that was a sign that that house was okay then, that it had been, they'd offered up their tithes to hell, so to speak, in the form of their firstborn child or their, their youngest child, I'm sorry. And um, so that's kind of, you know, the meaning of that. And now, of course, we just see it as a sign of, of you know, of, oh, this house is going along with the Halloween thing. You know, it actually has a much more sinister origin. And see, what people need to understand is that these symbols have a power all their own. I mean, you might say, well, it's just a pumpkin, for heaven's sakes. Well, yeah, it is just a pumpkin. But you see, in, in magic, in, in black magic, in the occult, there's this idea of, of thought forms and egregores. That's the word that's used from Greek. And it means basically something that, that, that gets power all of its own over the centuries, over thousands and thousands of years of use. And it kind of demons and strong men come to inhabit it. So even if the person might put this pumpkin out and carve a, a face on it and whatnot and put a candle in it and think, oh, I'm just kind of being cute like the neighborhood is, you know, it still might very well draw demonic spirits. So that's why we should not, again, as it says in Jeremiah, learn the ways of the Gentiles. Exactly. Yes. And um, also bobbin for apples. I mean, a lot of people think it's just a bucket full of water, you know, uh, just a bunch of apples. But you want to explain the horrific origins where this comes from well uh, the idea of it was is that originally they would actually take you know some of the leftover remains of the skulls of these children and use them as something to pull out of the water as kind of a, of a macabre game and uh, you know so you know again there's some sort of meaning behind this which which we do not understand and this is true of a lot of things and other thing that comes to mind is the whole thing of witches on a broomstick you see, uh, that actually goes back to the fact that in the Middle Ages, witches uh, would would literally take, see, the, the symbol of a high priestess's authority was her broomstick, which was called a besom. And she would, on certain nights of the year, when they were like planting crops or whatever, they would go out and they would jump around the field after they planted the crop on these broomsticks. And they believe that the high as they jump, that's how high the crops were. So again, we're talking about sympathetic magic, what's called folk magic. And it was believed that, that as they did this, that it would make the ground more fertile and whatnot. And of course, some people that weren't witches were probably spying to see, ooh, what are these witches doing? And they saw them, you know, jumping around this field. And, oh, they're going to take off and they're going to fly. You know, just like, you know, s some birds take a while to get off the ground. Well, there's another side to that, too. And that is that, that witches would use what was called flying ointment on nights like Halloween. They would take this ointment, which is made out of various hallucinogenic drugs. They'd rub it on their bodies, all over their bodies, and the ointment was supposedly to protect them from evil, but what would happen instead is that, that it would give them a trip, so to speak, like we would take acid nowadays. Well, these were like primitive hallucinogens, like belladonna, 
like aconite and some other other herbs that are hallucinogenic, but they're also poisonous. And so once again, we have this association of pharmacaea, of, of using drugs, and the occult and witchcraft all over again. And that's why to have a cute little witch hanging from your porch or whatever, again, you're emulating things that are of the evil one. And also, uh, most people think Halloween is just one day. You want to describe how it's actually three days? I think it's the 29th, 30th, and 31st? Well, it's what in the occult it's called an orb. And it does. You're right. It does start up like on the day or so before it, and then it goes one day after it. And that's why, like, again, you see in the Roman church, you have November 1st, which is, of course, the day after Halloween is called All Saints Day, and November 2nd is called All Souls Day in their calendar. And that's because they're just trying to kind of piggyback on this ancient pagan feast that had already been around for probably thousands of years. So, yeah, it actually starts a couple days earlier. And also, finally, um, you want to give a message to all Christians, especially pastors out there. Now, I've been to a lot of churches, and they say, oh, come come to Halloween, we're going to have a party, come dress as an angel or a biblical character. <clears throat> and do you want to give a good, strong message to these pastors, and also anybody that's a Christian at that, about not celebrating this thing at all, take no part in this? Yeah, I would really strongly recommend that. I mean, you can do something on another night. But you don't want to really honor this night because it is the night when darkness, if, if I were a pastor, I would have people pray and fast on that night because believe me, the witches and the Satanists are praying and fasting before that to prepare to, to, to create all this cone of power, all this energy that's supposed to be raised on that night because they believe that this is the night that the doorways are open between the realms of the dead and the realms of the living and that spirits walk the earth. And so, you know, you don't want that kind of energy going around in your community. And so if, if, if believers would take the time to pray and fast in and around Halloween for their children, for the protection of the children and the families and the churches and the community, that would be a much better way to use the time than to have a, a party where little kids get to dress up like angels. Absolutely. And, and when you, uh, you explain how they're fasting and praying, you know, the Satanists, is that with the origins of Hell Night? Because I, I believe uh, Hell Night's the night before, is that correct? Uh, yeah, I think in some, in, some, uh, in some cities they even have really bizarre things that are done on the night before, and it's called Hell Night. But, you know, the, the point is, whatever the culture is, they still, there's still these people that are very, very dedicated. They're like dark arc saints, if you will, and they will fast and pray to their gods for the destruction of the innocence of the youth, for the destruction of the morality of our young people, and we need to be just as diligent in getting on our knees and praying and fasting that our, our young people would stay pure, that our young people would not be defiled by the occult, and all these things. Big, big challenge for us, and we need to rise to the challenge. All right, great, and I'm going to shift gears a little bit here. I know you wanted to talk about Mitt Romney during our interview, during the Money Bomb, but you know, due to uh, overwhelming phone calls, we had to take the calls and all that. But, um, now, um, you want to describe what you were going to tell me about Mitt Romney, is uh, you do with the Mormonism and everything, and you, by all people, you used to be an uh, ex-Mormon, so if you want to give yes. a little description of what's going on with Mitt Romney. Well, the problem is, and I mean, I realize that either with Obama or with Mitt Romney, it's like, which devil do you choose? And um, the problem with Mitt Romney is he is a high priest in the Mormon church. He comes from a very old Mormon family, I think five generations of Mormons. And, you know, he's very much connected. He's been to the temple. He's gone through secret Luciferian ceremonies, and he's sworn blood oaths that in his mind would be more important than any oath he might take as President of the United States to defend the Constitution. Uh, and to see, the Mormon church has a weird eschatology, a weird view of the end times. They believe that one day they call it one mighty and strong, quote unquote, will rise and will save the Constitution of the United States. And among Mormons for many years, back when I was a Mormon, which was in the early 80s, they were talking about this, that one day we will have a Mormon become president. This is what they were shooting for, even way back in the 70s and 80s. And when that happens, then we will make him the prophet and he will become a benevolent dictator over America. 
and the Constitution will be done away with, and we'll bring in what's called the United Order. And if you if you look that up, uh, you know, on Google or whatever, as as what the Mormon Church teaches, the United Order is a communist society where everybody owns everything in common, kind of like a commune or a kibbutz, except on a national level. And uh, this ain't good because it means that the Mormon Church would basically be running the country. And people say, oh, well, that's just science fiction. Well, not entirely. This is what they believe. And, of course, a lot of what Mormons believe sounds like science fiction. They believe they can become gods. I mean, Mitt Romney thinks that he one day will become a god, and his wife will be a goddess, and they will reign over many planets and have many, many spirit babies, millions of spirit babies. This is Mormon doctrine. I used to believe this stuff. And the problem is there's a dark side to Mormonism. Because if you actually go through the temple, which I have done many times, you will see that most of the key doctrines in the temple are actually taught by a guy dressed up as Lucifer. And there's so much Luciferian stuff involved in the temple that, that it's really kind of scary. Uh, you know, you look at the Salt Lake Temple and some of the early, earlier temples, you'll see they're covered with pentagrams. They're covered with all-seeing eyes. Uh, we did this one DVD called Mormonism's Temple of Doom 2011 edition, which we have on our website. And we have pictures there of all of this creepy stuff, high quality photos of, of inverted pentagrams. And I'm sure many of your viewers know the inverted pentagram is a symbol of Satan, upside down five pointed star. And this is not this is not good. You know, this is the energy that's behind Mitt Romney, as nice as he appears. And I'm not saying he himself is like a devil worshiper or something. He may be, he may not be. That's between him and, and his God. All I know is, is I've been told by, because I have sources inside the high levels of the Mormon church, and I've been told that he's very much plugged into the Illuminati, to the Bilderbergers, to all of these, you know, high level, you know, conspiracy types. And and I don't know what would happen if he became president. I mean, I mean, I can't tell anybody how to vote or not vote, but I just think we need to really be on our knees praying and fasting for our country during this critical time because we're in trouble like we've really never been in trouble probably since the days of the Civil War. Exactly. And now, you know, a lot of people out there say, like, oh, we got to vote for the lesser of two evils. But they don't understand. I mean, I have friends and family that didn't even know people like Gary Johnson and other candidates are actually on the ballot because what the mainstream media does during their debates is only Romney and Obama. And um, Romney and Obama, just, I don't think there's any difference between the two. I mean, these people are warmongers. They support unconstitutional uh, laws like uh, NDA 2012, the Patriot Act, HR 647, and so on, and war with <laughs> Iran. And um, what do you what do you see coming out of this election here? Well, of course, I don't claim to be a prophet, but you know, I I'm not sure. You know, some people have said, well, you know, there's going to be some kind of a maybe Israel will bomb you know Iran right before the election, or maybe some big financial thing will happen before the election, and you know to kind of bump Obama up in the polls because you know usually if there's a crisis, people go with the incumbent. Uh, the October surprise thing. I don't really know. I mean, it, to me, I just I just offer this up to Yahuwah, to the you know the head of the universe and say, you've got to straighten this country out. Obama can't do it. Romney can't do it. Only going back to the Bible can do it. Exactly. And uh, we're, we're in big trouble. And uh, we found out a week ago that Romney's family, uh, his son Tag and his brother uh, Scott, purchased this, um, I forget the name of the company that makes the voting machines. They purchased all the, uh, you know, the voting machine companies and uh, having okay. a big problem up in Ohio, I guess. On the court order, they're supposed to have an early voting, but they're not actually doing it because and they're claiming that in Democratic areas, the voting machines ain't working. Huh. You know what I mean? It's just a bunch of scandal going on. But you can see equally on both sides how they're trying to throw this election. Oh, well, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's the trouble. At the highest levels, this government is run by the Illuminati. I mean, I think your listeners probably understand that because when I was in this this organization years and years ago, I was told that when a new guy is elected president, you know, whether it's Obama or whoever, that he walks into the Oval Office for the first time and there's a guy standing there who's one of the nine unknown men. And he basically sits him down and says, this is the way it's going to be. You're going to do this and you're going to do this and you're going to do this. And if you don't do this, look what we did in Nixon, 
look what he did to Kennedy. We can do it to you, too. And so, you know, it's like it really doesn't matter because there's a puppet master behind the scenes that, that is running the show, whoever happens to have the title of president. Exactly. And a lot of people out there are already aware that, you know, the presidents are puppets. But, you know, like you said, where they get their marching orders from is the high knocky of the world's elite, which is the Illuminati. And, um, and uh, uh, lastly, uh, do you want to explain basically how the Illuminati, how they're funded and how they actually affect um, all the countries like the presidents, the kings, the queens and so on? Well, of course, uh, it's traditional that in, in every you know, generation, if you will, of the Illuminati, there's there's a Rothschild involved, and of course the the huge banking dynasties, uh, all of those banking uh, concerns, starting with the Rothschilds. There, they, they, I mean, they've been creating money out of thin air, like for as long as at least since the days of the Federal Reserve being started. Uh, they they just you know make funny money all the time, and and they fund it that way. They fund it through drugs. They fund it through war machines. They, you know, that's why every time there's a war, I mean, guess who's making all the profits? You know, it doesn't matter what countries are fighting. The profits are being made by the Illuminati, and it, it's drugs. It's but ultimately, you know, these people feed on power. That's the thing people need to understand. And when you join an organization like the Freemasons or the Mormon Church or any other false religious system, Jehovah Witnesses, whatever, you're funneling spiritual power, occult power, if you will, the power of your own soul, your, your nefesh in Hebrew, into the, the devil's battery, if you will. And, and that's how he, you know, and of course, like I mentioned at the beginning of the show, you also have uh, blood sacrifices are used to raise power. Uh, all kinds of things are done. But, but people need to realize that if they aren't in the, in the army of Yahuwah, they're, without knowing it, in the army of Satan and in the army of Illuminati, except maybe they're just down at the bottom and they're cannon fodder. That's what Freemasons are. The typical Freemason is just cannon fodder for the devil. That's all they are. And they don't even know it, most of them. Exactly. And you also you want to explain basically in the early part of this country how, you know, Judge Washington in his farewell address warned us don't get involved with political parties and how basically the Freemasons and uh, the Illuminati created the Republican Democratic Party to divide people to the right and the left, which also ties into occultism. Now, in the cult, you ever see that movie uh, Pan's Haunted Labyrinth? Now, the, you know, the, the kids had a choice. You take the red door, which was the red, you know, the right door. And the left door was blue, and this relates into politics. You got the red, you know, represents the uh, right side, and the blue is the left side, and this is the occult as well. Do um, you want to give you a take on basically how the Freemasons uh, planted the Democratic and Republican Party here in the United States? Well, yeah, because that's that's kind of Masonic doctrine. If you've got, if you look at the Masonic temple, they talk about how you have this black and white checkered pavement on the floor of the temple, and that represents this dichotomy, this false dichotomy, like you say, between left and right, between you know Zionism versus fascism, between you know capitalism and communism. That that's how they work, or between left and right, between Democrat and Republican. The, all of these different things, they're all just a shadow play and the reality of it is is that both sides are being run by the same guy but of course what you see the word devil comes from the greek word diabolos and diabolos means to divide that's the root of that word and that's what the devil wants to do he wants to divide us and of course we've seen our country right now become more divided than it ever has been again probably since the civil war between you know the rich and the poor between the the, the conservatives and the liberals or whatever and that's what the devil wants because he knows you know the cliche divided we fall united we stand and we need to get together under yahuwah under the supreme, you know, deity of the universe and join under him and under the Bible. Because if we don't get this nation back on biblical track, it's, you know, it's going to be toast. And you it know? is. And um, I mean, look at Mitt Romney now. I think what he did was, uh, you know, uh, uh, Paul Ryan, I think he's supposed to be a Catholic, whatever. But hmm. you notice how they always bring in a vice president that appeals to the public, like they wanted a woman in the White House. So, uh, you know, four years ago, John McCain brought in Sarah Palin. 
even sure. though they didn't win whatever, but appeal to the American citizens. And he's doing the same thing because he knows, you know, the Christian movement's big and the truth movement's big. So he's hijacking this by bringing in a young Paul Ryan that claims to be of God and all that, just to, mm -hmm. uh, you know, go after the, you know, the true conservatives and say, hey, you need to vote for me because we're going to turn this country around. Mm -hmm. Oh, sure. Yeah. And I mean, you see that a lot. And of course, that's that's just politics. And I'm not I'm not knocking Paul Ryan. For all I know, he might be a very, a very, you know, godly individual. But, you know, I, I do know, of course, if he's a Catholic, there's some there's some spiritual issues there, which, you know, is another discussion. But uh, even though I was born and raised Catholic, it's it's there's a lot of spiritual bondage in that religion nowadays. And perhaps that's something we can talk about on their time with the Jesuits and all that. But, you know, it is it is. Is something where they're just deceiving us they're giving us you know really false hope and instead of putting our hope in their democrats and republicans we should be putting our hope in yeshua and in his gospel and in his truth exactly and just say paul ryan was legit he was constitutional he was a good guy whatever but people don't understand you know which are trying to soak everybody's vote but they don't understand paul ryan has no say what goes on it's uh, Romney and the puppet masters that have a say. They just bring in vice presidents just to, uh, you know, appeal to the public to, you know, just to grab their votes. Absolutely. It's, it's like I said, it's a shadow play. And all we can do is pray that the light of heaven would shine and drive out the shadows. Because that's, that's what it's going to take. You know, and that's why I'm saying we need to pray for, we've, we've had some great revivals in this nation, starting with the Great Awakening, you know, over 200 years ago. And we can have great revivals again, but we need, you know, believers to be on their knees fasting and praying for this nation like never before. Exactly, Bill. And, you know, I mean, we've got two evil demons. I don't think ever through the history of our presidency elections have we had two monstrous demons going head to head for the uh, title of presidency. I mean, these yeah, people I, are evil. I mean, like you got uh, Obama so-called fulfilling the Muslim prophecy. Now you have Mitt Romney supposedly uh, f fulfilling the Mormon prophecy. I mean, you're seeing end time stuff here. And uh, yes. in your final take on, uh, you know, just both of these guys. Well, the fact of the matter is, is that, is that Islam and Mormonism are two sides of the same coin. They both come from the same source, which is Satan. And, you know, they, they, if you look at the, how both religions started, they both started with an angel appearing to somebody and giving them a fake scripture, whether it's the Quran in the case of Islam or whether it's the Book of Mormon in the case of Mormonism. And it's the same thing. They're just two sides of the same coin. You know, one wants to create a socialist utopia with Islam rising. The other one wants to create a theocratic Mormon kingdom. And, you know, either way, you're in trouble. So we need to pray for the Almighty to give us a third alternative, which is his reign. Exactly. And we see the end times coming for sure. But, Bill, once again, I want to thank you for your time. And um, you got 30 seconds in closing here. If you want to promote your website once again. Absolutely, yeah. Please, please check out our website. We've got a lot of materials on this uh, topic. It's withoneaccord.org. W i t h o n e a c c o r d dot org. Thank you. Thank you, Bill, and God bless you, sir. You too. And that was William Schnobel from withoneaccord.org. Uh, you know, great books. I mean, I've been a fan for this guy for many years. He's got great documentaries on YouTube as well, exposing the Illuminati from within and um, all the documentaries you can see from the Prophecy Club and so on because he goes all over the country and does seminars. Well, folks, that will conclude our October 30th, 2012 edition of the InfoWars Nightly News. And don't forget, folks, InfoWarsShop.com and purchase Bloodlines of the Illuminati by Fritz Springmeier. Great book. I mean, if you want to know about the bloodlines and everything else of the Illuminati. And once again, you get stickers, you know, these cool stickers for your car and a nice uh, pocket constitution citizen's handbook. And, uh, folks, um, once again, thank you for tuning in to the special Halloween edition of the InfoWars Nightly News. Please Fund us, folks. We need you basically to join Infowars.com's uh, uh, PrisonPlanet.tv subscription, and you get five extra passwords, folks. You can give to your friends. So it's six accounts into one. Five ninety-five a month, folks. That's all, and it funds the operation as you see here. And once again, this is Dan Dandi for the Infowars Nightly News.